Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start the September 15th, 2023 Long Range Planning Committee meeting. Uh, first item on our agenda this morning is to review the minutes of August 9th. Anybody have any uh, concerns, questions, changes, omissions? Seeing none, the chair would entertain a motion. So moved. Peter, is there a second? Second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? One more time. Seeing none, all of those in favor? This is minutes, correct? This yes. is minutes. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> all right. So that is any opposed? Seeing none, that is unanimous. All right, item number two this morning is to review and discuss recommendations to the Ordinance Committee, Chapter 405B, Site Plan Standards and Commercial Design Standards Merger and Update, Draft Ordinance Landscape Requirements. Autumn, can you kick us off? Sure, so does everyone have a copy? I have some extras if you'd like to follow along. Um, we've spent a couple of meetings with this now. Uh, I included a, a new version with some yellow highlights. I'll pull it up on my screen and we can go through it. I think I've touched all the, the topics that we've talked about. Um, I also spent some time with the plant list, quite a bit of time with the plant list. We received the plant list from the Conservation Commission and to be perfectly honest, it wasn't complete. It didn't have, we've been getting a lot of questions at the planning board because we've been recommending they use the plant list. So we've been getting questions from developers and different folks. And so I really did a deep dive into it. Um, and I added quite a few things, rearranged some things and uh, cleaned it up a bit. So with that, you'll see if you get to that part, there's a lot of green and the green color is the proposed. So I just wanted to give you a, background on that one that's changed. Um, so if you like, we can just go through the questions. Autumn, can I ask a quick question? Um, on the, uh, the plant list, I know that we rely on the main natural areas program for the invasive um, species, but did you get them to consult at all on our list of plants? No, I didn't. I haven't had a chance to do that. I actually found this process really frustrating, and so that's all the minty and I'll do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I went through and I printed off uh, the Forest Service's complete native tree list and updated that. And then I went to the Maine Audubon Society. I learned a lot about native species to New England and everything, which was great and fun a little bit. So I'm a nerd about plants. Um, but I did not, I was not able to consult with anyone. I also uh, sent this out last time and I still haven't gotten any feedback from any professional groups. Okay. I'm hoping to have that before it gets to ordinance committee. Oh that's right. That's right. You were asking Yeah I haven't exactly. I haven't gotten a lot of feedback other than the initial the uh, the standards look are a good idea but the plant list is bad. So that's the extent of what I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Uh, Autumn, did you go to the um, main extension program? Yes. As well, yes. cooperative extension, yes. and they yes. they looked at their lists. I looked at um, the co-ops list, and I have everything printed out. If you ever want to look so at you anything, I actually subject to change. I actually yes, <laughs> yes. And so I actually thought when we um, after this meeting, I've set up a location on our website and planning for ordinance consolidation. And so I've been putting documents there, lighting is there. And so I plan to populate a lot of these links and a lot of that information to the landscape once I start getting this going a little better. Um, there's so many resources out there. So I think that um, adding, I'm, I'm on the right page, that's great. This list is subject to, uh, to periodic review based on factors that may change. This is what we added for this section. And then I changed this to an unlisted species because for perennials and ferns and all of it, there are so many. We, we got an application with one uh, 
this past week. And it's not on the list, but it's a good perennial. It's butterflies, it's, you know, it's all the things. So um, I added that so that we didn't have to have every great plant demand on the list. But you covered it under saying invasive mm -hmm. plants too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that's, that's the reality is we don't want things planted that are invasive. Correct. So that's, that's what I tried to do with this. Um, and then you'll see. So I also added a height column because this really, I think, gives you a frame of reference for what you're planting. You don't maybe want a hundred foot pine tree on this location, but you still want a nice tree. So this, I added that so that we could have some general, when we're reviewing it, we can add, we'll know what kind of tree we're going to get. Um, and so again, all the green are natives, um, now included. And then some things were moved. They were on the small list or a fundamental list. So they're moved now. And some things, some things were things you would plant in Texas and they weren't, they aren't for here. And I even knew about this. Um, so that has changed. Lots of moved. Some extra things for the large evergreen trees. Added in all of our pines and cedars. Right, regarding the height, are you looking for the planning board now to be more conscious of that? No, I think more for planning staff when we're looking at it and just as general information. Like if the planning board is looking at a site plan and they, oh, it's a Norway spruce and someone's, oh, that's a big tree. You know, yeah. there's power lines there. That's probably not a great idea. I don't, we don't, landscape architects should do their job and be looking at those things also, but it's just a way for all of us. Yeah. Information. So we're not I was just thinking every of, species. I was thinking more in terms of roadways. Sure. And, um, street height and clearance for equipment. Well, like snow clearing. Yeah, no, that dump. that kind of thing. I didn't know if that would then come into play. And the other thing, probably not anything I ever thought. Of, but, uh, in terms of the width of plants growing. Because if you start planting things near sidewalks, for example, you don't want people to be running into limbs. Or, so I just didn't know if that was gonna become more of a consideration or- Oh, we do have some clearance requirements in here. And I think that we do, um, well, sidewalks are in the right away. So this is not right away plantings okay. typically, but we do have clearance and some general guidance about what type of tree you should plant, where walkways are. Okay. And then I would envision someday uh, maybe looking at some species we'd like for street trees and like yep. defining that when we look at our street tree requirement yep. uh, subdivision. So we have a choice, you know, so yep. we really look at the roots that are yep. correct. I was also thinking in terms of not putting an additional onus right. on the planning board. Sure. So yeah, if I could, I could respond. I don't. We 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 trust the planning staff to think about clearances. Okay. And, and that um, I look at it, I, in I guess in terms of the overall aesthetics, is all of a sudden they're going to be an eighty foot tree. Um, you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, surrounded by 40 feet, 40 foot trees. Yeah. Um, is this, is the building, uh, are the trees going to be in some sort of relationship proportional to the buildings yeah. ultimately? Sure. Because the, the, the height is very helpful because otherwise we start off with about five, six to eight feet. That's it. And you have to start to imagine what it would look like as it grows. Um, and it's, it's very helpful to see that when you're presented with the plan and you're presented with the architect's drawings to think about what it would look like in the future. Mm -hmm. It's all in the eye of the beholder. We make sure that the planning department has figured out uh, clearances okay. uh, and and all of that. I again, I look at it in terms of the overall aesthetics of what's coming before us. Okay, thank you. I also added. Um, I'll go back to the beginning of the document. Added some definitions 
Oh, I opened the wrong. Oh, it's at the very beginning. No, I opened the wrong. Uh, I wondered why I got right to where I wanted to go. <laughs> um, I had made just a list. <clears throat> so I added some changes, some definitions, and this came up, Marvin, you had asked about the bare root plan, and I didn't receive any professional feedback, but it did a little digging on my own, <laughs> and uh, no, no one got the phone. Um, and so I added definitions and <laughs> bare root Sorry, plans. Delayed. Sorry, <laughs> too early. Um, I didn't find any issues with them that I could see. Um, and so these definitions are from our forest service. And um, so I added those and I think those are fine. I think especially maybe when it was written originally, there were some other known issues, but I couldn't find any reason to forget it. So, you should. so, so under, <laughs> under a typical that the applicant would present the landscaping plan staff would review it and assume, assuming it's okay as staff planning board would get a recommendation or a memo from staff saying we've reviewed the landscaping plan and it looks fine yes if 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 a, an applicant um, has an issue with, with the staff on that i didn't is there something in here that gives the planning board flexibility? There's only a few waivers at the end. And so these are the standards and you have to do them. Good. There's some flexibility built in how you do them, where you move yep. things, um, but the waivers are very defined. But when it gets to the board, at least in theory, staff will have said. Yes, yes. We do that now. We, you know, right. Staff recommends they didn't meet this and this, but our rules that we have now are a bit more subjective and loose, so it's a little harder. So it's almost more of a, you might think about this, so you could think about this, but this way we'll say they're missing six trees. Yeah. yeah. You know, six trees are required. Yeah. <laughs> and just, so it'll be a little easier. Yeah. Hey, yeah let, let me, let me say what, when there's an objection to what the staff has said, usually it's based upon the amount of landscaping, not the not specifically the type. Um, and the planning board has no problem saying, we don't think that's robust enough. You need X, Y, and Z. Um, but the, these new um, guidelines or ordinances, most ordinances essentially say you need six trees. And so that the applicant can decide to dispute six when, it, when they get to us, um, but it's clear in the ordinance. I was thinking about so the but, planning board can do what it really wants to do. Yeah, it, it's it's essentially we we try not to get into the minutia of the plant species, but we do say you need a garden here. You're you with appropriate okay. species. Okay. Um, and sometimes the planning board doesn't have a person who you know for a long time we relied on Susan Aquas, who was you know a person, but to who really took the lead on that, but. My question is sort of at the other end of Rick's statement, which is, is there an opportunity for a peer review too? If like there is a complex sure. sort of landscape uh, architecture review that needs to be done that's, you know, especially if we don't have uh, an arborist or technical person on staff. So. I don't think that there's anything that we've written that I'm not confident in my abilities to review, but if we ever got, it's not that complicated. Um, to be honest, I've been reviewing landscape plans for like a long time. Okay. Um, and, and it's not meant but it's, to. No, be... but, I, but we do have that capability. Okay. So yeah, that's even written in. on page 18. Okay. Okay. If, if we, the the if planning board at their discretion we, may require a peer review. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Sure. I just remember one instance on the planning for the board where we asked for it because there was a little tension mm -hmm. and we wanted to take it off staff. And well, and I think the way the ordinance is written now, it sets you up for tension. It, it sets does. us up for that. Okay. And so that's really, we're always set up for tension. Okay. We're always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because we're asking, we're like, I know they want this. Well, where does it say it? Does it but say, I know you're going to need to do it. <laughs> does it say that the developer will pay for the peer yes. review? Yes. Okay, good. So I think we're covered. So yeah. barring someone wanting to do a botanical garden. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Yes. Which would, be, uh, would be amazing. Uh, so I added <coughs> change that the ground cover is required. We talked about that last time. So um, we can't just have nothing uh, underneath trees. I have one question. Uh -huh. 
has to do with the preferred native species. Can we wait? I'm sorry, Mark. Sure. Can we wait till we get there? Because totally. we're almost there again. Uh, so in this section, I just added this statement. We have the buffer guard, uh, buffer guard trees. We had some language about utility conflicts, but I also added to allow for some design flexibility. And then um, buffer yards, residential adjacency added in the multi family uses adjacent to single family. Buffer yards required change that to 10 from 5. Screening, we changed the word site to building, so it was a rear building. I think this was the conversation we had last time, uh, making sure where we knew you could put the, the dumpsters. And then um, added this language for outdoor storage. Outdoor storage is pretty general and it includes so many things. So I added this uh, subject to the review and approval by the planning board. And the planning board may require additional screening notes. So this general language says where it should be, but then if it's an outdoor um, storage of an automobile for an automobile dealership, we're not going to have that because those are contract zones, but the planning board can say some additional screening if it's This one was a typo, so no longer 20 feet. It's not 20 inches. <laughs> and then changed um, primary entrance to public entrance, and then added the bicycle parsing part. Parking facilities, uh, not spaces, are required. Uh, you'd have to have one for every 10. Part of you want to capitalize B and board in the last line of N. Okay, got it. Change that to bicycle facility again. And now we're back, Marvin. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Um, I don't know if I have any recommendation here as far as the language to increase the use of native plants in Scarborough and the uh, preferred native species list. That certainly gives the impression of desiring native plants, uh, but I don't see any uh, ratio, or, and I'm not suggesting that there would be one. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as the planning board is concerned, or the overseeing body, generally speaking, with any more guidance uh, help, uh, native plants oftentimes are harder to find, perhaps more expensive, uh, and therefore that desire to have them preferred or otherwise increased uh, without a little bit of additional language might be my nice thought but that might be what that's about, my only suggestion. What about adding something um, for so the trees uh, they have to be you, you can't go off the list for trees but what if we have an extensive list of native species of trees for large deciduous and then we have a pretty good list for acceptable alternatives what about if we added some language that 75% of your tree selection has to be from the preferred native species list? And that, that's very robust. I might suggest 60%. Six, okay. Which is, what is, I don't think prohibited. I yeah. Guess. And I think since the list is it's much greater, there's a lot of choices. I don't think the trees, yeah, especially. I think you and I had that discussion a few, plan, a yeah, few a meetings ago that 60-40 right. worked. Well, it worked for the two of us. <laughs> I mean, I'm all for pushing it higher, but I, I started at 60, 40. From a practitioner standpoint, too, it, it, it depends on what's available and in what time of year you're doing the planting. So I've, I've seen a, 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 a design where you wanted 75%, but then by the time the the landscaper goes to install everything, things aren't available, so you have to do substitutes. So I, I just think we need to contemplate, if we're gonna put a ratio in, we need to contemplate sort of what happens if they can't meet that ratio for 
pretty common reasons. Yeah, but landscapers, if, if we're talking about new construction at least, I mean, they're planning far enough. Ahead. I, no, I'm talking uh, new construction. <laughs> yeah, well, the, I mean, my experience with them is the plans That's are small available. scale. I mean, is, is your experience yeah, small, small scale? Because when you're yeah. talking big scale, it's. No, I understand that. Okay. Uh, my experience is more residential than commercial. I, I do think there's some. I, I haven't I read this a couple of days ago, but I, I I think there's some flexibility in there for the length of time it takes to complete landscaping. Yeah. So if that if, they, if there's enough flexibility uh, that sorry you just missed the planting season, um, so you can't put anything in you know for a couple of months. Uh, if there is that flexibility, do you recall where it is? Oh, I mean, you probably uh, got it memorized. Page, page 17, the town yeah. recognizes the seasonal nature of landscape installation. However, all landscaping shall be installed within um, six months of the certificate of occupancy. So there's a six month window built into there and some yeah, language. Mm -hmm. So, either before or after the CO, you know, or you just say after the CO, that's it, because I'm tired of. I went and inspected one the other day for two years after CEO. Oh, yeah. Landscapers. Yeah. Landscapers are placing. This, this is the Porsche. Oh, this, this is, yes, yes. yes. Porsche just, owns this. <laughs> I love driving by and saying, I don't know when the hell they're going to put in that for Never. Or whatever the case is. No, the one that's no longer, is that's still not there yet. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, though. Landscapers are placing their orders for plants well in advance and should be able to accommodate. It doesn't always happen. It it depends. Depends. Well, it, there, certainly is, there certainly is enough choice there. Yeah, I mean, that if something the is 16. not immediately available or there's you know not going to be available yeah. for the next year. And we have had people to reconsider. contact our office and say, hey, I can't get this. Can I do this instead? And so if it's on the list, that's fine. You can, you can exchange like for like, you know, it's very close. Because yeah. I'm happy that 60 to 40 seems reasonable to me. No, would you want to do that for trees and shrubs? Those would be the only two I'm super comfortable with because there's so many perennials and other things. Uh, we're at, we built in some flexibility for uh, the more decorative plants. Uh, My feeling grass. is putting it against trees. Trees live a whole lot longer than shrubs. And right. And so trees you're living with. For, so maybe just trees? Yeah, the many, 60, many 40. years. I would say for shrubs too. Yeah, and some of those, some I mean, of the things that are categorized as shrubs are actually to be many, or many or trees. Okay. Yeah, in terms of the space they cover. So I'll add a statement in that 60% um, of all trees in shrubs shall be native from the native species. Okay. I think that's great. I had a somewhat different question about the list. Um, the list, this list is subject to periodic review um, based on factors that may change the viability or permanence of plant life. Page, uh, page nine. So, um, sort of at the start of the list. Um, that makes sense, but do we have to go back to the ordinance committee to get this list updated? Uh, no, this would be something staff would just run through. Okay, as long as it, as long as that's kind of clear that almost like a cleanup at the end of the year when yeah, we it, find it, weird things. I think this is being a kind of thing is an appendix that yeah. is being maintained yeah. by staff rather than a or rather than an integral part of the ordinance. Right, right. So, no, I would see us just running through this. Okay. Uh, cool. <clears throat> yeah, because you could have something here that for whatever reason suddenly gets identified as invasive species. Correct. So there's a known and pest that's taken right, out. Exactly. And so yeah. Correct. And I'm thinking that, that the pest side of things where pests come out of nowhere and suddenly start attacking whatever um, sugar maple trees, whatever it might be. So yeah. So take that back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. So I'll add that in. Uh, by the way, I really appreciate the uh, page eighteen. Uh, and going over to 19, the, um, the required list to be filled out. Otherwise, <laughs> people on the board are sitting there sometimes counting sure. the number. And it's very helpful to see uh, you know, what, what's required, what they've done. 
And this is this makes our reviews a lot easier, Robin, to your point. This is on them. Um, this is something I've used in other places where I was essentially great. You need to give me all this and then great. You've done your job. I've done my job. Mm -hmm. And I will count. Yeah, a lot of times people and it makes yeah, it easier for follow-up too. Yeah. It's much easier. Yeah. And it's right there. If it's required and provided is less than required, then you know yeah. you're not going to turn it in that way. Okay. So, think of all those things that makes your job easier. Yeah, and that's really the whole purpose is to make <laughs> our lives easier, the developers' exactly. lives easier, because they know what's on there. So that's kind of the purpose. Uh, let's see. And then we do have, and then right at the very last section, we have our waivers. Um, so we have, uh, they may reduce the amount of landscaping required for parking lots if additional landscaping is provided on other areas. So maybe there's some strange reason you can't get your percentage from parking lot because you have a nice area you can. That's a waiver. Um, the planning board may approve an alternative interior parking island design to address stormwater runoff or preferably for approval by the town engineer. So that gets into our low impact development standards. I added one may approve stormwater treatment areas located in the streetscape buffer yard and recommended for approval by the town engineer. So again, this is going back to low impact development standards, which you all are going to see. Um, and then an alternative planting plan if the site is not able to accommodate the required plantings, only as follows. So they can substitute one large tree for two ornamental trees. <laughs> Do you see that being taken advantage of a lot? I, I think I think with it spilled out, <laughs> they um, might get it's going to be difficult. I mean, we've had folks that just do not want to put in that tree, yep. and they keep coming back, and we keep saying, "We understand. We, we understand you don't want to. The tree goes here. Um, you know, we really meant what we said in terms of the the planting." Oh, but it doesn't. No. Put the tree in. Barnett language question. Um, the introductory sentence to section S says the planning board may review waivers. That implies that somebody else granted the waiver. Can you say, oh, sure. May grant or may approve rather than may review? Yes. And I would say a wave of requests. Request is, is what, what we're yes. yeah. mm -hmm. request. They approve waiver requests or something. Yes. I, I still think review and approve, maybe review and approve. Are you trying to say so that it doesn't go to CBA or something? I'm just saying if it says now it says may review waivers, it, oh, I get it implies point, that somebody else might that the staff, I, I guess. Would. I got it. I'll fix it. And I'll make that, I have that language and some other things, so I'll change all of the match. Let's see, and then we also have, so those those two are new, and then the rest are the same. Uh, so that's it. Good work. So are you ready for it? I'm going to take it to ordinance committee, because I went to ordinance committee yesterday, and they didn't have any future items. Uh, <laughs> I had three items yesterday with him. I'm like, oh, just to wait. <laughs> so, no, actually, we do. Chair, does this require a vote? Uh, that would be interesting. All right. I will move that we, um, I, will, I will request a motion to move this to the ordinance committee in its square form. Second that. Uh, with okay, so we have the first edits. Sorry. Right with the edits as proposed today. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, motion by Peter, seconded by Robin, just for the note taker. Uh, we have a motion on the table. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Nice, approved unanimously. Very nicely done. Fantastic. Thank you all. Thank you. The planning board, thank you. <laughs> okay. The next item is to review and discuss recommendations to the Conservation Commission, Chapter 405B Site Plan Standards, New Draft Section, Environmental Standards. 
Autumn? So this one, uh, let me get to this. This one is a new um, proposal that the Conservation Commission uh, requests we work on. It really has to do with setting up uh, buffers for wetlands, vernal pools, and the like. So we don't have specific requirements <coughs> for uh, wetland protection. So you have to delineate your wetlands, but you can go up to the line. So wetland here, development here. And so what we, we generally require in the planning board um, is on board uh, uh, some sort of buffer, five foot if they're gonna do a fence or something, but we, we go back and forth with that quite a bit. So this is something the Conservation Commission wanted to take a look at. So we presented this to them last, uh, two months ago, and there were numbers in the tables that you see as blanks. Our uh, starting recommendations were, I would say, sort of middle of the road. There was a lot of conversation about making them this big, and so they didn't meet this past month. So you're, what I'm asking you all to do is really look at the framework and see if, if the way it's written out and the language makes sense and if you can understand it. And then when they come back with numbers next month, I'll bring it back to you to show you what they put into place. Um, Could I ask that there be a preamble, sort of like what you had just mentioned about the, it's intended to be to protect and provide buffers for wetlands, vernal pools, and other protected natural resources. Just a, a preamble so that we know, because uh, when I think environmental standards, it could be a whole sure. host of things from. And, and, and Robert, you want something um, in addition to or to augment what's already in the purpose? Yeah. Because environmental, I will say the environmental standards uh, will become a new section. So that's where I tend to put the LID so it'll yep. build on it. Okay. Um, yeah, because I wasn't sure if this was coming as a, as a result of the new MS4 permit gosh, or, you know, some... Okay. Consent order, some communities have consent order. No, no, this is um, <coughs> these, uh, extra, something that we want to look at. So, a lot of this comes from samples from other places. Uh, Portsmouth has some environmental standards and buffer requirements. Uh, so, I've, I did this, I'm working with uh, the town engineer and the sustainability coordinator to sort of put this together and run through the traps. So I'm not an expert in all of these, um, but it's basically written in the same format as the rest of the ordinances we see. So for continuity and consistency. So we have the purpose statements uh, and then applicability. So this would, the way it's written now, these requirements would apply to all new development requiring site plan or subdivision approval. And so the way it's written is uh, any vernal pool, regardless of size, any coastal inland or freshwater wetland with an area, and this is to be defined, um, Scarborough has some very significant wetlands, and then we have some very small wetlands. And so uh, conservation is looking at what they want to do with that. And then any non-tidal perennial river, stream, or brook. We don't have protections on all of our rivers and streams right now. Why did I think it was 75 feet? It is for the defined ones, but there are others that don't have okay. some things. So I don't know if I should talk with you about this offline or if I should talk to um, the town engineer and the sustainability coordinator too, but DEP does maintain data mm -hmm. on how many acres of wetlands are destroyed each year in a community. And you only get that data if you ask Okay. And I asked for it a couple years ago, um, and it would be interesting to see what that number is so that we can plot basically the rate of change. Sure. And Jamie and Angela might have that already. <clears throat> but you specifically have to ask Mark Stack. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to be applicable. It's really definitions. Uh, but the, the concept of vernal pools, we have run into vernal pools that were man-made, essentially. Um, is there any difference in terms of protection? Something that's a vernal pool that was dug sure. 10 years garden. ago. I well, don't know. No, it's like a like where a tractor sat and now it's been sitting out there and then it rutted oh, yeah. and now it's a okay. vernal pool. 
<clears throat> or 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 it was a, a, a place where there was logging and you know there was some digging so and just also. where land has been stripped for whatever reason and now yeah, it's, and it's grown water. up a bit yeah. as a vernal pool but it really isn't natural it's, it's man-made and we've run into that in a couple of the couple of the, the places where the site is is old and it's being redone uh or is coming before us i can think very specifically the uh, speedway um there's a couple of vertical pools there that came about because of man's interference and, and a couple could, that were natural and if i could add on to that it really depends on who you talk to at dep as to what the rules are that apply to those man-made whether it's man-made wetland uh, because we have a lot of those that have applied um, from agriculture um that the way we used to do agriculture inherently uh creates wetlands but they have an inherent value. So it really depends on who you talk to at DEP as to what kind of um, interpretation you're gonna get. So I think it's a really good thing to establish what our local rules will be. For. Yeah, I, I think we need to dig a little deeper into, uh, into that difference. I, will, I suspect that Conservation Commission will recommend that no matter how it got there, it's protected. And then when I come back to you all, if there's a different recommendation that eventually gets the Ordinance Committee, I, this is, to be perfectly honest, the Conservation Commission is going to be way out here, right? Protect everything. I would like to use you all as my okay, reality check. What can we really do to get this approved? Um, because we don't want it to die. And then ordinance probably will tweak it a little bit more <laughs> in council. So the numbers are really going to matter, but that's one that's coming. Can, can we get something defined by the state that would align us, I would say, with their recommendations. Would that make sense? I don't think so. Um, I know in my, my dealings with our town engineer, you know, Angela can look at something, but this is a, this is a man-made three foot by three foot for a pool. It's, I don't need a hundred foot buffer around it. But, but you might. So, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. No, I'm just. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky one. You have language in there about particularly valuable habitat, which I think is where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I think this needs to be further defined, uh, so it's really specific. Um, we have, oh, where would rain gardens come in underneath this? If someone proposed to put in a rain garden, how would this this wouldn't be part of that. So, this is for what's existing. So, okay. So, okay. Well, I think that's, that's what we need to And part of your landscaping or your low impact development standards. <clears throat> so, this isn't it. So, protecting existing correct and vernal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, this is something, a uh, great example we get all the time. Um, subdivision goes in and they use wetlands to make their lot area. And they say, oh, we're going to, you know, draw a line on their deed, put a thing that says you can't do anything back there forever, and it'll be fine. It'll be great. <laughs> and then, <laughs> Friday's a little honest day. Um, we, we can see on online, and we can look at, they've pushed the boulders back. They've cut the trees. There's no protection. They right. never force it. They, it's, it's, yep. And so another piece that we're working on is that you don't get to count wetlands as part of your lot area. They have to be protected. Uh, we had one before the planning board the other day and staff, we don't have any rules, but staff is recommending, let's put that in a common open space or let's make it a hard line that's not part of your yard. It's, and that's a hard thing for people to understand because they buy it, that first buyer, you know, when you buy a house, you don't read all the details, the stack's this big. Uh, we get that all the time. Oh, I didn't know that's what it really meant. That's what it says. And, and the first buyer may be conscious of it, but the third buyer isn't. Right. All of a sudden, the third buyer says, well, that's some space to put in a swing set. And so this, putting something like this into place, when they come in with that subdivision or that site plan, there's <laughs> actually a buffer requirement and specific rules and you have to delineate it specifically. So it's really the idea is to protect it in perpetuity. So, so you're saying it's not part of the developable area. Correct. And what about like forested buffers that are deed restricted or out? You can, um, those should, those but should they be. shouldn't be part of the lot area. 
for a residential. You shouldn't get your count. Yep. Your wetland in the backyard is, especially if there's one neighborhood that 50% of the lot is non-usable. And it's really hard for us because we've done enforce those rules forever. The wetlands just disappear. <laughs> so, yeah, it's. So uh, are, are, are these standards both commercial and residential? These are just standards? These or? would be for anything that requires a subdivision. So they could be residential, okay. but it would be at the development level. It, it's not for a single family home. Not for a single family building. Right. Okay. It would be for, um, you have 10 acres and you're going to put 10 homes, that first initial subdivision. Understood. Got yeah. it. Okay. All new developments are on site plan or subdivision. And, and let me say, we have that going on right now with a lot that trying to get them to form a home and HOA to take responsibility for that. We have another one that's in the pre-app process that we've had the same conversation with. Uh, their land is actually more suited to go into SLT and set up a conservation system, but we're really trying to, on the front end, Let's attack this. Um, we get it. the problem. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of thinking of commercial developments mm -hmm. too. Where you know they they've had to put in a forest buffer, or they're using forest buffer as a stormwater management mm -hmm. treatment system. So I guess yeah, must be hard on forest. And, and some something that's that's eligible for or attractive to land trust. That's. That gives us an out. I mean, that that's a way to take care of it. Mm -hmm. The the one that's before us now, um, it's an isolated site. Backs up on the railroad. So it's not. It, the, the, mm -hmm. I don't think the, the the land trust is going to want uh, what, about three, three. They're, gonna, they're looking at it. They're looking at it. Three quarters of an acre surrounded by roads uh, and or a railroad. I mean, that's that's kind well, of behind the railroad. Stay positive. <laughs> if, there's, if there's a way to link it to other things. Um, so anyhow, that's uh, it's difficult. And it's difficult for the, the developers because they want to get as much as they can without driving themselves crazy. Uh, and the job of the planning board sometimes is to drive them crazy. <laughs> so we're going to move on to the next one. And this is really uh, the part that's up for a lot of conversation. Um, I think. So this one is basically, so the way it's defined now, the natural resource, there's wetlands under 1,000 feet, there's wetlands 1,000 to 10,000. These numbers might change, and then the numbers in the boxes are, uh, is what the conversation is really about. But a natural resource setback would be that first setback, it's a hard line, you can't basically do anything in here. And then the vegetated buffer is an addition to that. So once this all gets the proposals completed, I tend to add some diagrams so it's really clear resource. This is this, what you can do here, what you can't do here. Are these the only um, categories of standards that we're proposing? Right now, yes. Okay. Do you see any others that you? No, I don't, but it's, it's definitely where I'd almost like to see, is there another town or is there a sample standard that we could look at? Um, so we would be the first that I know of in Maine that would do something like this. This is... Um, Anything outside of Maine or... Portsmouth is one of the best examples we found this sort of new. Uh, but I have not seen a lot of other... Good could we maybe see the point? Again, part of it is I just don't know that what a complete list of standards would look like. So sure. um, if we're inventing it from scratch, and this yeah, is our maybe starting point, sure. But sure. yeah. I know that Falmouth has got some pretty stringent wetland requirements. I don't. That's a, I don't know. Yeah. I, King King Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if Falmouth might, but I just know that they were very, they were one of the very first towns in the area that got very strict with wetland and wetland, wetland development. <clears throat> so I don't know if they might have something. I'll definitely take a look at this. I'd, I'd like to 
you know, kind of put in a marker for um, in, in case things change. In other words, we, we've had cases specifically at the Downs uh, where the wetlands were mar marked at the very beginning. And now the wetlands have actually significantly changed over a few lots. Uh, and they've come back to us with a new wetland survey and a couple of places that weren't eligible for building in the innovation district are now eligible for building because of those changes. Is there a way for somebody to come back and say, the wetlands have changed? Yeah, the, the wetlands have disappeared. Can we use this now? It, it, is there that potential and how would it be done? Well, it, it, it would be, I guess. Um, so they, they started an appeal. Is it an appeal, a straight amendment? Uh, do they have the ability to do that? And, and if they do have the ability to do that, then, then there probably should be something that says uh, you have the ability to amend the site plan upon these conditions or to ask for an amendment. So well, an just, just think has, about how that would happen. An applicant always has the right to come back and see amendment to any of I guess the question would be, what's the criteria that triggers coming back yeah. and requesting amendment? Because I don't want to be, we shouldn't be tied up with frivolous stuff, but when there is a, a change, you know, five years in the future, six years, there should be something in here that mentions that. Well, okay. What does the site plan review it say about the amendments? Doesn't that provide? Yeah, they would, you would have to do it. I think she's just wanting to tie them together. So it's, here, that it's not prohibited by being excluded. That's not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that change. It changed from not a from from a wetland to not a wetland. To not and a now wetland. you want to use it. So, what, so that sounds like a violation of the National Resource Protection yeah. Act. Yeah. So that's not something that the town would want to stick our neck out in front of. Well, it's already happened then because they, in this case, they they came back to us with a new. Uh, a new analysis of the wetlands at the downs at the innovation district uh, that the wetlands had changed, the wetlands had moved, and that allowed they changed the hydrology. That allowed, and so that's however it happened, and that allowed two more lots. As, 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 a, as, a, as a layperson, so you're moving too fast for me. So, um, if I could just ask to take a step back. Um, so, as I understand, the conversation is if the site changes over time, um, then uh, can, the, can, a, can somebody come in and file a new site plan? Is that the first question? Or an amendment. Or an amendment. Okay. So that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the first question. Um, the second question, and this kind of is, um, is to your point, Robin, if, the, if it involves a, um, a reduction of wetlands, it sounds like the um, the federal act, by definition, says that can't happen. Well, how many times are you going to come back and say, "Oh, guess what? I've now made a wetland, so let's protect it more." Well, I, I want to get to a third case, which is more in my mind on that one, but I just want to understand that that's kind of what that act says. Yeah, that's a that's a protected land category. Is gotcha. a wetland, vernal pool, uh, prime farmland. There's a whole bunch of them. Because the third we've one, already built on the one so. in my mind that I can see happening more with rising sea levels and things like that is that is that areas that formerly which were not wetlands become wetlands. Right. And yep. so what happens on this for, for that? Right. Does it, 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 and does this mean that um, okay we approved a site plan in 2023, um, but in 2035 um, it's now a wetland, or there a substantial portion of the site is now a wetland? Does the only um, avenue for a review of that take place when the applicant comes and asks for a variance or asks for a new site plan? That's the only avenue. Yeah, we would never. So if they, in 2023, they yeah. got the permit and they were fine and they built on it and then 2030, it's a wetland. I don't know what will happen in 2030. Things may change, but the way the rules are now, we wouldn't do anything to them unless they came back and asked for, they wanted to expand their use or do a change. And then you'd probably see that it's EA. Gotcha. Okay, and, and, and that's got so now we're focused on 
the issue that you're talking about with um, with uh, um, wetlands becoming non wetlands. And we'll do that. Okay, just wanted to step through that for my benefit. Sorry. So, where's our counselor? And, and, and that's why I said put a marker in it for that discussion and to really take a look at what it might mean. Who are the counselors that are supposed to be at this meeting? Uh, John Lucci and April, but John's the normal. So I think that's a good, um, I'll make a note of that, that we need to think about what that language might be. Um, and if it's happening, it, it's yeah. a problem. So I have just a dumb question on that. Um, if new wetlands can emerge naturally, can some wetlands dry up naturally as well? Is it always a case? In drought, okay. But you're primarily changing the hydrology. And a drought is the is the hydrology changing due to natural effects right. or climate change. Okay. So climate change, you know, natural or not, we could be having a whole bunch of violations of the National Resource Protection Act. Yeah. But Karen, to be fair, you know, vacant property on Haggis yeah. that might be fifty percent wetlands now in five years, nobody's touched it. It may not be so much. So we do require a new delineation. The delineation only be five years old when we look at them. Sure. Um, and those have to be done by a certified wetland scientist and to show us what's out there. So yes, you could have a developer do things to make them go away. They could go away on their own or they could get added. Lots of different things. Well, it sounds like it's, there's a, an event that takes place, which is the site plan review and the site plan approval that fixes permanently through time right. what is wetland or not wetland on, on mm -hmm. the site. If there's no site plan, that nothing's been fixed yet. Correct. Right? Yeah, and, and there are ways that you can destroy wetlands, but you have to go for the permitted process. Right. And to me, it sounds like we haven't gone through the permitted process to destroy those. Gotcha. And wetlands are, you know, waters of the state, they're navigable waters, so they don't, they have state and federal protections. No, I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about the moment at which that wetland gets defined as a wetland. If there's no site plan on it, by definition, nobody's doing anything to it. So there's been no definition of what's the wetland on the site at that time. There's, there's federal mining. Well, that's not yeah, right. I'm asking the question. That's not really dope enough, so yeah. But if putting aside going to the planning board, if you own a piece of property and you want to build on it, you, you've got to check things like wetland. You just the law says you can't build. I mean, it's not that. It, it's a question of I own a piece of property. Um, it has been in my family for a hundred years. No one's wanted to build on it. No one's done a review of that. And there were there was a vernal pool there sixty years ago. I can remember going down and playing in it. It doesn't exist anymore. Is that still a vernal pool? Like, that's the question I have. It's like it's, it, it, if it's only in the memories of the the far past. That's the professionals. That yeah, it's right a, okay. Isn't it the point of the survey? When you... that's 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 all. So that is the stick of the ground. The point of the survey and the point of the approval of the site plan. At that point, that map of wetlands on the property is what will be used for all future periods to determine what is a wetland on the property. And you can't now in the future say, oh, it's no longer a wetland anymore. It's like, nope, the site plan for 2023 <clears throat> said that was wetland. Too bad, so sad. I don't think it's that precise. It's not that, so you, the site plan for 2023 would say that, but what there is, and we've seen it where a new wetland delineation because changes have occurred or DEP and DEP approval is required for those things too. It comes back and says uh, the wetlands have changed and now we have X. And so that's an amended so site plan or something. Vernal pools can also only be identified during a small yes. window. Okay, yeah. yep. So if you need to rush and push your development and you don't test for vernal pools, mm -hmm. then, you know, that's, it, it gets overlooked all the time. Yeah. If it's overlooked all the time, and I, and I guess you know where I'm coming from, you know I hope you all understand is, you know I'm not a, a diet or tree diet. I'm like that's our brand. person. That's our friend. <laughs> that that marsh right there, that that cleans all of the water that runs off all of the development in this town that is growing so fast. And if we are destroying that piece by piece by piece, small vernal pool by small wetland, there's going to be an effect there, and we're starting to see it now. Yeah, no, and and and, and um, completely understand where you're coming from. That, and I'm I'm on board with that. Mine is the forward view of again. It's more that I see 
the, um, the, the wetlands, things that today are not wetlands will be wetlands in 50 years. Um, and I'm and, um, trying to imagine where the conflict really? is going to start coming in. Like that. So you're talking about water level rise. Yeah. You're talking about climate change the other way. So Correct. Bringing yeah. the water table back into the land. Correct. You're yeah. talking about uh, marsh migration. You're talking, yeah. and I think that that's a really forward thinking place that we need to go. Yeah, and that's good. And, and, and part of it is, I see where we're going with the standard here and where we're kind of going with the frameworks. I see that risk, though, that the hydrology is changing yeah. on the upward side, kind of putting potentially stress on. But, it, but it's not happening, though, because what we're doing is if if it were to come back and go through the infiltration and push up, that would be great. But that infiltration is not there, that natural pathway. No, no, you right. back we shut that up through construction. That's right, so. through curb and gutter systems that are just, that are making it happen faster and faster. So what we, this low impact development standard that's that's coming is so important for us to get on board of and be thinking about in all these future sort of ordinance amendments. So thank you for bringing that up. And Peter, uh, one you may be familiar with, Cliff site. That's a resource protection and our ordinances we had this one shot for 30 years, right? To do something about that site and our ordinances, the way they currently exist, say that you can put it back the way it was on the same footprint, even though our new rules say you can never build there to start with. So that's something we really need to take a look at too, to address the sea level rise and yeah. when, things, when things change by allowing, taking your, your shot away every 30 years or so when things get rehabbed or redeveloped, you're, you're not doing yourself any favors. Another so, example is non such river brewing. Like I remember when that came to the planning board and they built parking lot right up yeah. to the edge of the delineation. And you know, I I I I you know have since talked to DEP about why would you give a permit to do that? And DEP will say, just because it has a permit doesn't mean it should be built. Yeah. And so, so they these, put it into these standards that's would right. not let that happen if you have that's right buffers in place. Because yeah, and, and, and then I think of that, it's like with, with rising water levels, you could see that being underwater five or six times a year. Yep. Um and under and, and, and therefore water comes up, wipes off oils, wipes off all this crap from the um <clears throat> from, from a parking lot, and then that, that now gets shoved into the the, the, marsh, the, the little marsh back and the so, shellfish. Yeah, correct. And and so are we envisioning that sort of those changes that will likely occur in waterways that are constrained are more like floodways than true waterways, if you think of them. Um, and um, yeah, that's that's my concern on this one. Um, and, and again, part, part of my, my concern, um, my only worry on it at this stage is do we have any other model legislation or model ordinances that we should take a look at? Um, because uh, I look at this and say, okay, but I, I'm not sure I have the imagination enough to be able to apply this yet. And I agree. When I started looking, this is not my field, so I start to look, and I couldn't find a whole lot, and I really need some science, too, so I'm, I'm weighing on the conservation. I'm like, I, good ideas are good ideas, but I need some science behind is he this. Is still on that? He has been away for a couple of months, so he's... That's why they canceled their last meeting. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get some more scientific data. You know, this sort of distance is needed. But it's hard to sell. Your land is no longer developable because we have this great buffer. But if you can give me data that I can show up and I can understand and explain, um, but that's on them. They've got to really help me with that. I don't know what the council's position is on that one. I think it's important to know that at some point. But without, even without the scientific data, you know, I would be inclined to be on the more extreme end of we're taking developable land away mm -hmm. um, because the trend certainly is indicating that that is the right way to go. Yeah. That, 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 that increased buffers are required, um, even if we don't know exactly how much we should um, increase them, increasing them is the direction we should go. Um, but again, it's not just buffers at that point too. It's, it's all sort of the permitted uses is, mm -hmm. is the rest. And I just, Want to imagine the full set of things, and I, I hate to say it too, but it's sins of our past, yeah, as well. Yeah, you know, it's that number that we get from DEP like, how many wetlands have we destroyed? You know, 1250 square feet at a time throughout that. Yeah, so sorry to kind of no, no, no this, is, this, this is great. And this is part of uh, understanding, this is more conversation than I had at the last time I presented this. Yeah.
Yeah, the piece of this, you know, tagging on Peter said, is also natural habitat for wildlife mm -hmm. because people will complain, well, we've got all these deer, we've got all these raccoons, you know. Well, if they don't have any other place to go and do their thing, they're going to come into your yard. Yes. I mean, we have to accommodate the fact that we're affecting the whole of creation, not just sure. ourselves. I mean, where, you know, I. <clears throat> I, I'm a Mainer now, but where I came from in Texas, development was so fast and so intense that there are coyotes in, you know, downtown Austin and Round Rock and just in people's streets and you have to worry about your kids and a very urban, like nothing like you see up here uh, situation. So yeah, it's it's definitely a real threat. And we see that as, as, as Mainers as a real plus about living in Maine mm -hmm. is that we maintain a natural habitat. Oh, no. Well, turkeys. Well, <laughs> the, the Canada geese. Those are mine. Yeah. But now we've got possums in Maine. And, and I can remember when they were only in Virginia in the 50s, right? and then in Rhode Island in the 70s, and now in Maine. So they're moving north. Yeah, well, it's Adams. better climate, yeah. you know, it's cooler. So the next part of this, after we talk about what we're protecting and the distance, then there is a table that um, further defines what's allowed in those areas. And so the way it's set up now, fernal pools, nothing is permitted. There's some uh, river, stream, or brook has some things permitted for public rights away and sidewalks, piers, and then wetlands, vegetative buffer. And so this idea can be built on too. Mm -hmm. um, we can add different things or change things. Could we add a row below each of them that shows what their setback? Is because I think last time you were on pools, there was a setback of like 275 or 300. Well, the natural, so the natural resource, um, yeah, you know, it should be actually, yeah, I need to fix it. I see what you're saying. Yeah. There is a natural resource setback. But the setback should go in line with this. So there's yeah. two, each one, like the fernal pools, there will be a natural resource setback. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it needs to, I'll define it a bit better. Rather than blank, we have NP for not permitted. Sure. So just, uh, well, visually, it's a little bit easier for me to recognize that. Blank is how we do it, everything else in our ordinances. So I'd rather not uh, change it for just this one. Okay. Sorry. I got to hold on to that one because I don't want to change all the other things. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do other things. I'll here. mark that up as soon as our past. <laughs> yes, so sorry. <laughs> Um, so I see this, this could grow and change a bit, um, but you know, like fences, this is one that we struggle with on a regular basis. So for natural resource setback, you could have a fence, but there's a condition in here that, oh, we'll have them reversed. The condition is number one, not two. Um, there's no footings and no ground disturbance within five feet of the vegetative buffer. So that's some... So now we have a wetland, a vegetative buffer, and then five feet of fence. What of kind of fence? Construction kind of fence? No, right. uh, just any sort of fence. Any, any fence. Okay. But right now we have a fence that can go right on the line of the wetland. And then you have Angela, mostly Angela and a meeting going, how are you going to build it if you can't get to the other side? You have to set it back, right? You can't put your foot in that wetland. <laughs> oh, we can build it. We can build it from one side. So we are always asking for a five foot at least space just to have the fence built. So this would get you the wetland line, a vegetative buffer, five feet fence. So that's what we're, we're thinking. Really make sure you're not having any activity in that, that important resource area. And again, I just look at this list. I think there's got to be more permitted activities here that we would enumerate. Um, and not to say that we should permit them. I'm just nothing saying, else is permitted. This is the only thing that you do, period. Right. So okay. nothing else. This it's is a shorter list than I would have expected. Yeah. Okay. We shortened it quite a bit. Uh, we have our from shoreland zoning. The list is really long. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it needs to be. Okay, gotcha. That too. Are we going to look at shoreland? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say, <laughs> no shoreland. <laughs> Eventually, yes. I think yeah, <laughs> that needs to come up too so we get in line with that. So then, I don't mind with a question. Sure. Uh, 
the agenda item mentions review and discuss recommendations to conservation mm -hmm. commission. You may have said this and I missed it. Has the conservation commission looked at this yet? They, they did at their meeting in August. Okay. They looked at the same draft, but the draft had numbers. And they um, were they, all over the place with their numbers. Did they make any solid? They didn't make any solid recommendations. Okay. They were supposed to meet about it again um, last, Monday. this past Monday, but they canceled the meeting uh, because two of their members were not going to be available. Well, speaking what? only for myself, I would like to see their input before we drill down okay. too much. I mean, they have the expertise in my opinion. Uh, and then practically speaking, what's doable and what's not doable from our point of view, um, I would like to apply to that. Okay, well, I think this conversation has been good to tweak a few things and add a few things. And so their next meeting in October, they can look at just a few basic recommendations from this group and changes um, and then it'll, They'll, it'll come back to you. I know they're going to sway in a mm -hmm. fairly significant way. I, they so don't review know. ordinances like you guys do. You are wonderful to review language and really, uh, I know sometimes it may seem tedious and we get in the weeds, but that is, you all really do a good job of that. Um, so I, I still want to be She's able to looking at you, Rick. I'm looking, no, I'm looking at all of you. That's really, I mean, you know, this, what this group is designed to do. So it's really. <clears throat> I don't want to extend this discussion, but have you or Bernstein Shore discussed the Sackett case with you and our, you know, in a part with the law, the Supreme Court case recently oh. that essentially said wetlands aren't wetlands unless there's a continuous connection to a right. lake. My understanding, and I don't do this practice much in this area, my understanding is that if state law is more restrictive, then that would control. Yes. And then furthermore, if local ordinance are more restrictive than state law, that would control. So I don't think the Sackett case has any impact on our ordinance unless you had, unless we didn't have anything. Right. So, but That's I always get a little confused as to yes. local, uh, state, federal. That's my understanding too, Rick. But I think we're okay having a more restrictive. And of course, this says that provision criteria set forth are in addition to. Mm -hmm. So I think we're good on if somebody were to come along and say, you can't regulate this wetland anymore because the United States Supreme Court says it's no longer wetland. The answer is too bad. Yes. We're entitled as a matter of state law to have more restrictive. That's my very generalized understanding of it as well. Um, we run into that at planning board all the time, too. Like there's a you know a discharge somewhere that DEP has permitted or the Army Corps has permitted, and then um, you know, we say, you know, this while it's permitted by the state, the planning board can be more stringent to your point, Rick. So this is getting more prescriptive to that end, which I think would be really helpful. I'm protecting a, a, you know, a natural resource that defines sure. this town. Sure. Particularly Scarborough. Yeah. And the marsh. So this is in the early stages of. Yes. And I think following up on my one other thought is following up on what you said, Peter, at least when I understood it, part of what you said. Is there marshland in Massachusetts where we dealt with this previously outside of the state? Yeah. I'm sure I can probably take some more class in court. Is, is, is homework for next time mm -hmm. that you mentioned the Portsmouth um, ordinance that we get to look at? And then I agree because there's tons of marshy like land in northeastern Massachusetts and in, in the cave in there that may have had some local work done. Yeah. Yeah. Temperature laws that are ahead of us. Well, or even the Everglades in Florida. I mean, watch how things have really been evolving in Florida. Coastal zone management in Massachusetts is a little more um, stringent, so that would be a good place to look for yeah. for these things. But but the but the um, the wetland that we have is so significant. The only one that compares to it is the Mid Atlantic. So if we really want to be forward thinking, we want to be looking at Chesapeake. 
Perfect. to see what yeah. regulations and you know recommendations they may have yeah. for us to protect a, a, a marsh of this size and nature. That'd, you know, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great. And if there are any other um, examples of anything else, okay. yeah, I'm just looking to be educator, get some background to be able to comment more intelligently. Specific on. places in Chesapeake Bay or the whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah. There's like an eight state uh, coalition um, of folks working together on low impact development. Um, these stormwater initiatives, these maintaining buffers and, and the like. And I think we can find a lot of um, uh, fertile ground there for you know every pun intended for us. Because they've got a fishery frameworks yeah. to protect, and they're really very stretch. Reach out to Captain Lee um, as our CVM coordinator. Mm -hmm. And she'll know the CZM folks in all the other states. Okay. And she routinely sits on the new committees oh, with them. Okay. So yeah, um, she'd be a good contact with them. In terms of page you got up there mm -hmm. under G, can we get that wording to be similar to what? I'll we'll change all my wording. Already. All my. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna okay. make it all match. I love things that match. <laughs> So match all those other documents for NP instead of blank. That'd be a great one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing it. <laughs> Maybe someday, but they all match now. They all match now. <laughs> You're good. I'm good. All right. Thank you, um, Eric. Once again, do we have any public on that might comment? Okay. Uh, staff updates. So the, uh, I think I've told you all about the lighting ordinance that went through sustainability and then to ordinance committee that went successfully through and it's gonna be in front of the planning board at their meeting next month. So that's exciting. That'll be the first part of our ordinance consolidation. Um, we, um, we have some, we're in the midst of short-term rental investigations as well. If you are all curious about that, uh, you can reach out to me. Uh, we are, Do we have anything else exciting? There's so many things. <laughs> Landscape, anyway. environmental standards. We're going to get back to architecture soon, I promise. I'm hoping to bring it back next month. And, and so, that was my question. On, yeah. What do you have next on our agenda now that we've gotten the commercial landscape design standards? So, um, back to architecture. Back to, back architecture. to where we were. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Derailed a little bit. Um, I think for the rest of the year, the plan is architecture. And then after that, and this environmental standards probably won't be ready to even come back. If it stay, if it if it's processed through conservation the way it should be, it should probably take a little bit more time. Um, so architecture, and then next on our list is uh, parking. Which sounds exciting, but when when do we bring up mixed use? Um, we talked about the idea that we don't have that our ordinances are oriented very much towards commercial or residential, and we don't necessarily have. Um, uh, design standard or, or sort of a, a ordinance dealing specifically with mixed use development. I don't know. I don't have that on the time frame because we do have several districts that allow mix of uses to happen. We have we have all the residential districts, obviously R two, R three, R four, and then we have these village residential districts. But then when we have Highs Parkway, um, CPD. Um, TBC, all those, there's some mixed use components to all of those. Okay. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I think it'll be wrapped in. Gotcha. Um, yeah. To other discussions. Okay. As, as we think of that, then um, we were talking about commercial. Um, do we have a timing or, or, a, or a, 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 do you have a time frame in your mind for hitting those other development areas, uh, those, those other um, uh, zoning areas? Specifically, the ones like the village standards and the, the rest. Village standards. Yeah, that, that um, do their they're, they're, envision kind of mixed use. Yes. So we'll get through the base standards for architecture, and then and then I envision us picking off our top village and going. We are doing the transportation master plan. Oh, I want to make a plug for that transportation master plan. Uh, open house is on September twenty sixth. It's Tuesday. It'll be in this room from four to eight. So come and go. Um, so hopefully we'll get, get some information for that as well, and then we'll tie it together. So next year we can pick off areas. Um, so the base standards first, and then uh, going through each one of those. 
And then we also have, um, we oh, have yeah, I have to <laughs> just for a second because you mentioned parking. Mm -hmm. And before we go very much further, can you give me a timetable of when we're going to be discussing parking or other? It depends on how fast we wrap up architecture. I would like to wrap up architecture by the end of this year and then start parking. And you're talking about town-wide parking regulations. It's really looking at our parking ordinance. So it's coming up, not to digress, coastal waters, mm -hmm. just unbelievably. Yes, um, yes. It, it, is it a matter of coastal waters and are, is it put the brakes on a little bit because we're going to be doing it town-wide? Um, I'd be interested to see, maybe not, because maybe it's a little, it might be, uh, could run parallel, okay. because the parking standards we'll be looking at are requirements for uses, and yours may be more specific to the areas that okay. you're talking about, so I think yeah. they can work parallel, as long as we can say, sort of in contact, know what's going on, so as long as one doesn't undo the other, or and I think that also needs to be, as far as parking, as far as coastal, needs to be in conversation with transportation and traffic because we're looking at how do we mitigate increasing parking lot sizes, say at Higgins and so on, by looking at other alternatives. Yeah, that's so, very helpful. Now, they, they seem help meant to go off in some direction. <laughs> Pardon my the Friday, I'm honesty. You're all set? I think so. Cameron? I'm good. I'm going to mention we do have an annual meeting that everyone is invited to on October 3rd at the Black Point Inn. Uh, so if anybody is interested in attending, please let me know. Uh, just send me an email. I think I have enough sponsors that I could probably comp everybody. Do I need What's the date? October 3rd. So Tuesday evening. Yeah, Tuesday evening, 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, when is the uh, when is the chamber's um, candidate forum? I thought oh, that was October twelfth. Like... Oh, twelfth. Okay. I'm just kind of going around the table, Marvin. Anything in terms of committee updates or committee member well, updates? I, I I I fell down on the job. The transportation committee meeting was my birthday, which I was planning to attend, but my wife surprised me. So <laughs> I missed it, and I would turn to Portia to make any okay. absence. Yeah. That there is the uh, transportation um, open house, as it were, uh, invitation to the general public to come in and give us input in terms of um, where they see traffic issues around the community, but also if you were wanting to get to Higgins Beach by bike or walking, would you feel safe doing that? Where where would you go if you used alternative transportation? Um, but looking at um, safety issues around uh, neighborhoods as far as uh, walking or biking, um, what we're doing, at least with the bicycle byways, because we're continuing to work on that process, is asking people to take two stickers and say, if you began from this destination, where is it you want to go? And then put your other sticker there. So we can begin to evaluate based on the number of stickers in that location. We may need to look at this route as far as how safe it is to walk it, how safe it is to bike it, okay. and what we may need to do to accomplish. While you have the floors or anything else? No, probably. <laughs> okay. Peter? No, oh, so I've worked in quiet, normal course of business. And um, uh, from the library's perspective, nothing to bring. We've got a new library director. But uh, other than that, uh, well, actually, that is one thing. We, we have recognized the um, need to refresh the strategic plan for the library. Um, and that will actually be a fairly major effort. So we'll kick that off. Um, uh, uh, before the end of the year, and uh, we can keep you guys informed on that one. Okay, great. Um, the planning board is going to be holding a workshop in our meeting on Monday. Um, we are currently we meet every third Monday, uh, and that creates problems for people trying to, since it's not consistent other than Monday, for people trying to juggle some other obligations. So, right, right. so like Monday, no meeting, no meeting. Monday? Yeah, every, okay. every, third, every third week. So we're looking at going once a month um, for a couple of reasons. And one is it allows 
uh, the external reviewers time to get their information back and take some of the pressure off of them get to get the information to us. And um, strangely enough, the planning board actually doesn't have a lot to do in, in that we no longer have the 14 pounds of paper um, and the applicants are being spread out more. I don't know whether that's the new rate of growth ordinance, um, but that's what's happening. So for this Monday coming up, we have uh, two applications, both of which we've seen before, period. Okay. And two and two public hearings. So um, we think we can do it. We think we can go to once a month at a specific date, which will then allow people to book on another Monday regularly if they need to do that. I, and I would owe our ability to do that to the, the planning staff because what is coming before us now in terms of applications is significantly improved. Uh, in other words, they, they work to uh, make sure that what comes before us is actually ready to come before us. Um, in, in the past, developers basically said, yeah, I know you're, you're, you're recommending something, but we're gonna go to the board. So the board gets it and we say roughly, uh-uh. Back to, yeah. back to the staff. We're not having to do that. So that's changed the type of work that we've had, the crunch of work we have. The only thing we've got to think about is what happens if we all of a sudden do get a giant stack and how would we accommodate yep. accommodate that? So um, looking forward to it. It's a, actually a significant change uh, in the way we've been working. And how it can be, can be very helpful for the developers as well because right. I think what happens is with the three-week schedule and the documents do, they wind up having to sit out a month because they can't get their stuff ready. So it could allow uh, people to move faster through the process, oddly enough. I think it's it's more predictable and the work that they're getting, the assistance they're getting from the, the planning staff right, and the advice they're getting from the planning staff in terms of don't bring this before the board yet, otherwise uh, they're gonna say no. And then after a couple of times where we've said no, um, the message I think is is kind of out there that the planning staff is their best friend okay. in terms of getting something to us. Great, thank you. Great. Now, all set. Robin, I just want to um, <clears throat> I guess say two things. One is to thank uh, Autumn and her staff for making planning making applicants more prepared and more complete before they come to the planning board. Um, Editorially, when I resigned from the planning board, there would be 17 items and we'd only get through eight every three weeks. And we would get caught up on applications that were not ready for planning. So that is huge what you've done. And I think it's a great accomplishment. And it does signal nicely to the, develop, the development community that there's gonna be consistency and be ready. The second thing is um, I just would like to say that I'm so relieved to see us here at this point in looking at environmental standards for um, the town of Scarborough because, you know, when I first joined the planning board, I was, you know, uh, literally accused of being anti-development and only for the environment when I was sort of voicing the fact that natural resource protection requirements were, were really not, not being looked at. Um, Constructively, I'll put it that way, without sort of libeling myself or others. Um, but I'm really glad to see the path that we're on, and I'm really glad to be here now and part of this group to move us forward. Great. Okay. Uh, I basically have one thing that I wanted to say also. The appointments committee finally met. <laughs> um, so there is action being taken place. Um, so a couple things in regards to that, it, it now needs to go in front of the town council for two readings. I think the first one is a week from Wednesday. Uh, if it's, it would either be next Wednesday or- Or the following the week first, for the first yeah, reading October. and then, then the second reading. And also uh, there'll be, I will not say anything in terms of positions or anything until that occurs 
And secondly, I believe that you'll also be notified by the town, most likely individually, uh, before that occurs as well. So expect something from, I believe, Toady yeah. at some point down the road, um, but that may or may not occur prior to uh, town council actually approved. So at least we're seeing some activity, which is a good thing. Um, the nominations committee or the appointments committee um, is public. They 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 have the they're they're online. Um, but can you tell us what came up? What came out of that? It was. So it was I'd, ra I'd rather not. So you're, you're going to make me watch the ninety minutes of the appointments committee. I, my my whole thing is I want things approved by the town council uh, before we go online and make any comments. So. Wow. Because nothing is done until town council says it's done. Well, I guess I'm not asking for comments. I'm just, again, looking to avoid having to um, watch the 90 minutes of YouTube that are already <laughs> posted on YouTube. So I'll so, tell you. That'd be great. I pre appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Um, but at least YouTube, so. you can fast forward if you need to. It does, yeah. <laughs> Which is actually entertaining sometimes. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay, got no problem. Yep. Um, Motion to adjourn. Uh, I have the habits meeting on the six, but that's the old schedule, right? Right. I believe that the next meeting is the thirteenth. Yes, Friday the thirteenth. My daughter's birthday. Uh, I, I do want to say too, this is a great room. I like this room as they set it up now and and that. So I don't mind meeting here on Fridays. I think this is working well. And, and choice, right? I also yeah. think this setup, by the way, if. If you are, in fact, um, watching from afar, I think this actually is a pretty decent setup where you can see everybody and hopefully you can hear everybody speak. So that would be even better. Uh, and let me just say, Friday the 13th, I will be in Cape Breton. Okay. So I will I, at the Celtic Colors celebration. So I will not, I will not be here. And right. I will be in Florida. Sweet. Uh, Anybody else join? <laughs> not voting members at this point. So all of the voting members would, I mean, you get moved up, and I didn't do that at the beginning of the meeting. I apologize, I should have. But obviously, if you're here, you will be moved up if town council has not already made uh, whatever decisions that they're going to make. So there will be five of us. We should have a we should have a quorum. That shouldn't be a problem. Uh, up on what Rob mentioned about the council member, council members being absent. I am relying on my memory. Well, I don't think this is the first time in recent memory. Yep. And I don't know what the protocol is, but can we put out a request to have the council members attending the meeting? I mean a polite. However, you do that. Cool. Yep, I'll talk with Autumn, and one of us will will ask if they, you know, hopefully they can coordinate their schedule. And at least one of them can be here. That would be appreciated. They do uh, after the election. I believe they'll all be sworn in on November fifteenth, and we'll get new a new liaison in January. Uh, yes, it could be new or the same or whatever, but yeah, it, it all changes. Same. It's John and John. Well, John, so. yeah, our April. John Clucci is not up for re election. Right. So, uh, April. Or he's choosing. Or he's choosing. Right. Okay. Okay. So, we have a motion to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Second. We have a second. second. We do with Rick. So, Peter and Rick. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? And any opposed? No. <laughs> Let's move forward.